It is widely accepted that during the last century, the humankind went from a civilization of the word into the civilization of the image. Indeed, from all sides, we are engulfed in images. The number and the intensity of organized visual information that we receive each day would be unimaginable to the human being living in the past. Now, while you're watching this, each second your brain must process 25 images filled with detail. It is easy to compute how many images per minute, or hour that is. As soon as you leave the home, you are accosted by a new visual information. Advertisements, notices, signposts. A person has no time to deal with one image in one instant, to analyze it, to digest it. He or she has no time for inspection. We stay on the surface, on the external appearance of things, but also on the external appearance of people we meet. It is as though the proverb becomes ever truer that the clothes maketh the man. Or rather the clothes and everything else that can be seen about us, that makes an image of us. It could be said that our time has brought a kind of hyper-production and inflation of images. holy images. To a 21st century man, this may sound anachronous, even unbelievable. One of the intrinsic traits of the Eastern Orthodox Church are indeed holy images, the icons. That is, making obeisance to the icons Theatropos, God-man Jesus Christ, of the most holy Theotokos, Virgin Mary, the birth giver of God, as well as those of the saints. There is an essential difference between the orthodox and the heterodox understanding of holy images. While at the West, holy images have a goal to induce a certain religious excitement with their vividness, impressiveness of presentation, and by evoking the persons on the image. Being a pious soul to adulation, the orthodox icon serves as a link between the one who prays and God, Theotokos and the sanctified. The icon serves as a means of approximation to the transcendental being of divinity. Hence, portrait exactness and preservation of the ancient iconographic image type are not as important for the Catholic West, but are absolutely essential for the Eastern Orthodoxy. For that reason, religious painting of the West possesses more freedom, flair, and diversity. 
The art of the East contains surpassingly more purity and strictness in the iconographic figures of saints, the Theotokos, but also Christ, whose religious image is often so imperfect in Western masters, even in ingenious painters. Even though the West generally does not accept or has insufficient interest for the holy tradition preserved in Orthodoxy, and in general for the entire cultural tradition of the Byzantium and the Orthodox world, the icon seems to be an exception to this rule. Yet, how much does the modern civilization understand and feel the icon? Highly organized cultures of the ancient world left us with material traces of the religious systems upon which they had been built. The recognizable styles of Egyptian painting, created in a period of several centuries or even millennia, only the uninformed may interpret as a lack of knowledge and perspective by the Egyptians. Much rather this would be a script canon formed on the grounds of Egyptian religion. The Greeks have left us magnificent sculptures. We keep forgetting that they too are a reflection of Greek beliefs outlooks on the world, metaphysics, a petrified ideal. Byzantium icons too came into existence from a cult, from the Orthodox divine service and the worship of God. The difference is that, unlike the dead religions of antiquity, the Church is present in the world through epochs and, by promise of the embodied Son of God, as His body, it shall be present until the end of history. Even the quite occasional enthusiasts of history of art easily recognize the petrified style of the Byzantine, that is, Orthodox icon but many of them are astounded when they learn that holy icons are being painted to this day and not only as souvenirs. However, if we approach the icon only as a work of art, we shall go fully amiss. Its essence will evade us. The mysterious icons show, but at the same time, also contain that which is hidden from the common eye. In Orthodox Church, holy icons are not just decorations. They are far more than that. They are organically connected to the holy mystery of the Eucharist. The holy icons made with hands open our spiritual eyes so that we can see spiritual and elevated realities. That is, an icon reveals and shows to us that which is hidden. It can be said that the existence of holy icons and their understanding is a precondition for the correct understanding of God-revealed Christian teaching and of that which stands before humankind if it wants to live in accordance with the God's redeeming plan of salvation of created beings from the deterioration and death. A Christian is not simply a viewer of an icon. 
but is above all a devotee and an icon duel, one who respects icons. Because through the holy icon, man experiences spiritual rebirth and enters into unity with the living God. In Orthodox Church, holy icons have always had a similar importance that is given to the precious and life-giving cross of Christ. But looking at and by obeisance or veneration given to the icons and the precious cross, a Christian receives blessings and simultaneously reaches a higher spiritual knowledge, theosis. From the Orthodox point of view, in a certain manner, the holy icons and the precious cross are teachings of a deeper meaning. In the Orthodox Church, the first Sunday of Easter, or Great Lent, is called Sunday of Orthodoxy. It is dedicated to the victory of iconoclasm and to the reinstatement of observance of icons in Constantinople in 843 AD. Re-establishment of veneration of icons is considered the first great victory of orthodoxy. Icon dualism has, up to this day, been one of the most important traits of the Orthodox Church. For all these reasons, we can infer that by getting to know the theology of the icon, we are in fact getting to know the most important truths of the Christian faith. The word icon, icon, image, likeness, figure, type, comes from the ancient Greek verb eko or ika meaning one, look alike, am similar, am alike, appear, am the same. The word icon is used to denote artistically faithful painting and sculpture, representation, copying, of a being, his or her facial features, or an object. It is important to underline that the said expression refers exclusively to something that is real and true, that is, to something that relates to a given model and prototype and does not relate to anything that is spacious, illusory, imagined or non-existent. The view of the Holy Fathers of the Church is that only the images of things that do not exist are to be called idols, such as the images of non-existent gods invented by Greek mythology. According to the teachers of leading Greek philosophers, the visible and material world is an image of the invisible world after which the material world is created and organized. An icon is viewed with the intrinsic bond of the imaged, drawn likeness. There existed a conviction that the represented character on an image is essentially, effectively, and truly present in the image. Such beliefs had existed much earlier among Eastern peoples who believe that their gods or rulers are indeed present in images and iconic representations. Any destructions of such representations was considered and interpreted as a direct attack and rebellious insurgence against the figures that such images or sculptures represented. According to the Orthodox Christian understanding of icon, which is based on biblical sources and the holy scriptures. Even the holy image and its model are firm in a bond. They are never completely equated. To us, this may appear a completely absurd difference. Modern man is not prone to believing either in the presence of a depicted character in the image or in the link between the depicted character and the image. For a modern understanding, the issue here is of completely separated realities. In his great adventure, modern man has done everything to master the world that used to frighten him and make him insecure. By use of science, humankind has drawn sharp boundaries of physical reality so that, as much protected from outside influences as possible, we could confine ourselves to the safety of our own self. We know, of course, that one several centuries ago, the world was different, more enchanted. We study how a great battle it was to disenchant it. 
We all remember how growing up we had to remind ourselves and others about the fallacy of many phenomena, and links between phenomena that we had accepted through child intuition as truthful and important, beautiful or frightening. In order to function unhindered and healthy in a modern world, in order to reach our projected, albeit somewhat confined self, we had to constantly remind each other what exactly the scientific image of the world is like. We needed to study and practice so as not to remain slaves of the outdated image of the world around us. Consequently, we are undeniably not prone to disrupting the fortress around ourselves to the risk of contact with the hidden world, in which links between different levels of reality exist, to be sure. The courage and the possibility of preserving healthy mind and personal integrity in contact with the disturbing, living reality of links between the visible and the invisible world, we are offered only by the real, true faith. And the holy images, icons, are the real place to test the faith. A portal for the return into God's world. From a faceless and mechanical world of modern technology that is ever more growing into nothingness. The Old Testament describes holy history. The fall of man from God, the painstaking deliverance to God from a world in which by his own will man has become an unprotected toy of a variety of spiritual forces from a world of idols. In the Old Testament, painting and sculpturing were not discarded as harmful and useless, so therefore images and symbols did exist in the temple of the Old Testament. Drawings and iconic representations of the invisible God were forbidden. And the Lord called unto Moses, and he said, Let them make a sanctity, so that among them I keep, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upwards, overshadowing the cover with them. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cup, its calyxes and its flowers shall be the biblical stand one piece with it is that it is impossible to make iconic representations of the invisible God. To the chosen people it was forbidden to create images or sculptures for liturgical purposes so that people serve them as they would serve God. Since idolatrous people had made statues of their gods, the Old Testament laws forbade creation and statues of such gods above all with an aim to prevent the fall of Israelites into idolatry. The Holy Scripture of the Old Testament notes the words of the Triune God. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The Jewish word Selem, the 70 interpreters had translated with the Greek word ikon, image, likeness, face, type, model, Latin, imago. However, the expression in image, after an image, after a model, is used completely differently. It is much deeper and signifies an eternal link with the spiritual kindred of man with God the Maker. It would be absurd to think that man's outward physical appearance represents the real, actual image of God. It is exactly the existence of this image of God in man that helps man to get to know the Lord, get to know himself and the world around him. In the Old Testament, the Israelites had only listened to the voice of God, but they had never seen his likeness or his face. When Moses asked God to see his glory, he got the following answer. You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me in your In the book of Exodus, it is said, You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. 
The second commandment of God does not absolutely forbid creation of images, symbols, drawing, effigies, woodwork carvings and similar, but forbids creation of idols and statues which represent God, with which the people would replace the true God and serve or worship them. And thus, according to the biblical and patristic teachings, commit the ultimate sin. In a number of preserved old synagogues, such as this one in Dura Europos, in Syria, whole narrative depictions have been preserved displaying biblical events. St. John of Damascus, in the defense of holy icons, says the following. God charged David to build him a temple through his son and to prepare a place to rest. Solomon, in the temple, made the cherubim as the book of kings. And he encompassed the cherubim with gold and all the walls in a circle. And he had the cherubim carved, the palms inside out, in a circle not from the sides, be observed. And there were bulls and lions and pomegranates. Is it not more seemly to decorate the walls of the Lord's house with holy forms and images rather than with beasts and plants? As Solomon receiving the gift of wisdom did not by making cherubs and the likeness of bulls and lions depict God, which the law forbade, thus we do not depict God when we make images of the saints, who made themselves temples spiritual. The Orthodox Church remained consistent with the Holy Tradition, and it did not depict an invisible God on its icons. That is, it would have never even depicted and painted God had the Son of God, Word of God, God of Logos. The second hypostasis of the Holy Trinity not become incarnate. Only after the Word of God had incarnated, had become true man, had entered into history with all human traits except sin, he became visible, palpable, fully describable. And from then on, he is depicted in icons as Theanthropos, God-man. It can be said that by becoming incarnate, the Lord, God beyond description, describes, depicts himself. In the biblical scriptures of the New Testament, the word icon receives new meaning. The Savior's words, He who has seen me has seen the Father, were directed only to those who, looking at Jesus Christ the man, at the same time comprehended his divinity, which he shared with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He who is God, deigned to appear in human flesh of ours, so that we could see in the same way as we see when depicting the divine model of living. And so in this manner we would be able to imitate the one who made that image. The man has again become the icon of God, an image painted by the finest of painters, Jesus Christ. And thus as a spiritually revamped and rekindled icon of God, the man expresses the beauty of his paragon prototype, model, original.
Already at first glance, the language of the icon greatly differs to that of other visual arts. Until the appearance of avant-garde art of the 20th century, the Western fine art was dominated by centric perspective. The central so-called objective perspective is characteristic to photography. Film. And even this program you are watching. The perspective on icons and frescoes is quite different. They call it reverse or Byzantian perspective. It is an expanding perspective, meaning that the lines come from the viewer are not converging toward an imaginary remote point, but are expanding, diverging away from the viewer. Before an icon, Man is not the master and the virtual owner of the world, but a participant in God's creation. Cracking of the illusion is also helped by polycentricity of the icons and frescoes. Multiple centers aid us to comprehend the faces or objects from multiple angles all at once and not satisfy ourselves with the illusion of one static and passive, monocular, cyclopic point of view. The Western art accepted this iconic approach only at the beginning of the 20th century. Icons also depict several chronological phrases of the same event. An event is observed from the perspective of the end of time when the division between the past, present, and future ceases to exist. Therefore, one of the same character may appear on an icon or a fresco even numerous times. For example, in the representation of Peter's denial of Christ, in a continuous space, all three denials are represented contemporaneously. But Peter's repentance is depicted as well. On the icon depicting transfiguration, we simultaneously see Jesus and the apostles climbing Mount Tabor, coming down from it, as well as the very event of transfiguration in which also, by the will of God, prophets of yore, Elijah and Moses, appear as victors over time. There is no shading in icons. 
Whereas the contrast between shade and light is one of the most important expressive instruments in Western art. Icons encompass everything, but they also permeated from within with the uncreated light of God. Carriers of the shadow are just creatures of the evil, crippling, diminished in their self-destruction, without a base in the existence of God. Icons show the man and the world already reshaped in the eschaton, in the events at the end of history, when God will be all and will end all, and nothing will be out of God and his light. Iconography, that is, the icon, is a kind of language that in its own way, by delineation and color, faithfully expresses the teachings of the Orthodox Church. It is a theology that is expressed by use of color, drawings, visual images, and shapes. However, this does not mean that the icons are a sort of hieroglyphs, or sacred riddles, which the dogmatics may translate using the language of conventional signs. It is a generally known fact that the early Christian church language of symbols was especially prevalent. This symbolism is explained, first of all, by the necessity to express through art the truth that cannot be directly represented, expounded. On the other hand, concealment for some time of the fundamental Christian mysteries from those who are preparing to, for baptism. The catechumens was established by the Holy Fathers and inspired by the scriptures. Speaking of the symbolic wording used when teaching the catechumens, those who are preparing for baptism, St. Cyril of Jerusalem says that all are allowed to listen to the gospel, but the glory of Annunciation belongs only those close to Christ. Consequently, the Lord spoke to those who are unable to hear in parables. While he explained the parables to his apostles in private, for what for the enlightened is the shining of glory? For the unbelievers, blindness. Heathens are not exposed to the mystery teachings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, nor are the catechumens clearly spoken to on the mysteries. Rather, a lot of things are talked about ostensibly, in the form of stories, so that the faithful who know would understand, and those who would not know, eschew harm. Christians primarily used biblical symbols, and when they used symbols from the ancient world, for example, fish, Orpheus, vine, they attributed a deeper meaning to them and filled them with new dogmatic content and new Christian meaning. However, another characteristic of Christian art had emerged in the early centuries, the image, form, is reduced to a minimum of detail with a maximum of expressiveness. This laconism, restraint in the means of expression, also corresponds to the laconic and reserved character of the evangelical preaching. Ever since that time, the artists have sought to bring their works to the highest possible simplicity the deep content of which was available only to the spiritual eye. The artist was cleansing his art of anything individual. He stood in anonymity, works were never signed, and his main concern was to focus on transmitting the tradition. He was obliged to give up self-sufficient aesthetic enjoyment and to use the beauty of the visible world to witness to the higher world. His language was to be very clear and accurate. The icon is, therefore, an expression of the plan and an order of salvation, which briefly put, attests that God became man so that man became God. 
A meaning of existence for holy icons consists in the fact that, on the one hand, they testify the reality and incarnation of the Word of God, and on the other, they witness and profess the empirical and phenomenological reality of the grace of the Holy Spirit that one receives in the church as a gift from the triune of God. This is why ecclesiastical art differs from every other art. Holiness in communion is also not just a need that every man has, but it is as well an ability or a gift from God that man possesses. Man as a personal and iconic being in communion with other personal beings gives, presents himself to others and grows as a person within the community. It is indeed a valid objection that a simple set of people in one place do not make one community if they do not commune between each other and if among them there is nothing similar, common, which brings them together. Between the represented, the depicted figure in the icons made with hands, and a Christian man, Icondual, there is a mutual living conversation, a dialogue. By watching and honoring icons made with hands, a man comes to the same information, relevant for his salvation, that can be acquired by reading or listening to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. The basic trait of the language of the icon is that it is a language of prayer, and in its form is hymnic and praising. By honoring the holy icons and by watching them, man realizes that the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ, the immaterial and the material world, are in dissoluble unity, and clearly sees that Christ has united heaven and earth, and connected the spiritual and the invisible with the visible and the tangible. Orthodox iconduals are able to realize the mystery of the incarnation of God the Logos, the Word of God, through the holy icons, to understand, that is, how He, as a natural icon of God the Father, appeared in order to re-establish and spiritually reshape the fallen man, who had been created in the image of God. In a word, holy icons reveal to us a mystery, and that, and at the same time, testify that the cause of why the Word of God incarnated is our salvation. The historical fact is that the peoples who have embraced Christianity have also assumed the iconographic language that was built in the nexus of the Christian world. They accepted it as an empirical expression of truth that they received sealed in artistic forms. Iconographic language of the church is not to be accepted passively, but in a creative fashion in conjunction with the local artistic tradition. Every nation builds its own artistic language against the backdrop of a general foundation. In this manner, produced is multiformity in unity. Language of the icon is in fact the language of the Orthodox Church, which reminds man that he is the icon of God, and that only by living the holy sacramental life he shall enter into a living communion, theosis, with his prototype, God the Maker. The icon testifies to the existence of God with love, not evidence. Iconography is an art quite insensitive to the physical reality rendered by usual optics.
Iconography imposes its viewer its own principles, teaches the viewer of the real, true viewpoint. The orthodox image writer, or iconographer, faithfully transmits a concrete true image, and in it he reveals a different reality, which is a spiritual and prophetic one. The Orthodox Church has never permitted the drawing or painting of holy icons according to the iconographer's imagination or a living model. This would in fact indicate conscious and complete breakup with a prototype, as it has been done in the West where they do not need iconographic canons. The consequence of which is an abundance of individualistic arbitrariness that has plunged into deep secularization. The ecclesiastical iconographer does not express something indefinite and vague, but rather the self-revealed truth. In the Orthodox Church, the rule is that the holy icons are made according to the ancient consecrated originals prototypes. An iconographer, as a spiritual man, has nothing to invent, but relies on actual characters and events, and calls upon the icondules to enter into living dialogue with the sacred figures, iconically represented on icons made with hands. Loyalty to the tradition is not merely loyalty to the antiquity, but a living relationship with the fullness of church life. With patristic experience and a genuine, original is the only image writer, iconographer, who reaches to the source, to God. Faithful capturing of the ancient prototypes is not merely copying, because the iconographer is indeed allowed to freely and creatively express his or herself. That is why we stress that, even though the question of replicating, so to say duplication of ancient models, yet we will not find even two identical icons, because the similarity that is noticed when watching them only highlights the complete originality and individuality of each one. According to Orthodox teaching, the icon becomes the icon only after the Church recognizes the genuineness of the painted figure to the ancient archetype. Or in other words, when the Church writes in the name to the character on the icon. The right of this appellation, that is the determination of the self-identity of the likeness painted on the icon, belongs only to the Church. The painter devotes only skill, and the arrangement of that which is to be painted comes from the Honorable Fathers. Due to this, the decision of the so-called Council of a Hundred Chapters, held in Moscow in 1551, reads as follows. All those who work diligently and with piety receive grace and blessing from heaven, but all those who strive only for the love of money and care not for piety better think twice before they perish. In addition to truthful faith, for the reverence and veneration of holy icons, a Christian man, Icondule, must be adorned by spiritual purity 
and the sacredness of life. And the iconographer is a charismatic person who creates the form, the icon, with the collaboration of the Holy Spirit. As for the Orthodox iconographer's divine inspiration, we should say that they are inspired by God and endowed with the gracious gifts of the Holy Spirit in the same sense as inspired by God with the Church Fathers, ecclesiastical poets, hymnographers, cantors. These gifts help them bring a lacondual man into union with the sacred figures, painted iconically in icons made with hands. According to Orthodox teaching, there is a close link between art, theology and Christian life. Famous is the maxim that the Lord ought to be sought in the simplicity of the heart. When painting an icon, an image of Christ, the Orthodox iconographer firstly experiences the love of the triune God in the church as a community, as a mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. Only then, with fasting and prayer, that is, having spiritually prepared, does he begin to paint, as he was taught by the church, in the spirit of tradition of the Orthodox Church, that which he experienced in the encounter with the incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ. An iconographer is a free creator. He does not abuse his freedom. Moreover, an icon painter is not an individualist, but he is a spiritualized and churched personality and is inseparable from the community, from the church. The awareness of freedom, rights and obligations of the icon painter is a solid basis for the development of Orthodox Christian culture. The artwork of an iconographer is an expression of faith and witnessing of the Orthodox Church, by which, according to St. Gregory Palamas, an enlightened man, already here on earth, becomes miraculous. He competes with heavenly powers in the continuous chant, he keeps on the ground, and as an angel leads to God, all of creation. All in all, just as the inner concept of the holy icons is fathomable only to iconographers touched by divine inspiration, so too it is available only to spiritualized iconians. According to the Orthodox understanding, the icon, and with it the entire culture, is inseparable from the liturgy. That is, it is organically associated to it, and is an integral part of the liturgical sacrament. Should the culture be separated from liturgy, it would then lose its sacred character, call and thought. As the holy icon as occult objects, we cannot understand outside the liturgy. By the same token, we cannot understand cultural if it is to be separated from the liturgy, for the liturgy is its living space. The goal of the Orthodox Christian culture is to bring to and accomplish in man and the world around man as much divine as possible. In other words, to incarnate God in man and the world. The Orthodox feel that the Western art wandered into a dead end and a spiritual wilderness because it stepped away from the liturgy, that is, from the church and its canons, and it misses the Holy Spirit and its dynamic drive. When it is true, a culture emerging from a cult returns to its liturgical roots.
we can safely say that the culture on Earth is an icon of the Kingdom of Heaven. Spiritual art neither imitates nature nor the material world, nor the arbitrary characters from the human imagination, but the things that belong to the realm of the spirit using sacral and symbolic forms and mystical colors. It is not contrived nor conceited, but plain and humble. It does not serve to human passions, but to God. It is not individualistic, but all human. For it is not guided by personal, subjective preferences or the worldly tastes of time, but a dedication and divine grace. Byzantium is an example of flourishing of such an art. When it shall serve the kingdom of heaven, culture is the one that will justify the history of man and his priestly calling in the world. In holy icons, everything is permitted by immaterial divine energies. And that is why in icons, everything is different. Space as well as time. In icons, the characters of the saints are represented from the point of view of eternity, and they do not depict the images of mortal, fallen, and earthly men, but rather the images of spiritually reshaped, deified, holy, redeemed, and heavenly men, the new Adam. These images are those in which the light of Christ has shone. The orthodox iconography iconically represents, depicts the spiritual transfigured world and elevates and introduces Christian man into that world in order for man to become a co-inhabitant of that world. This is an unending and eternal world, the kingdom of heaven. In the second commandment, the Lord, through Moses, commands the chosen people, You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, 
or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, am your God. When Moses asked God to see his likeness, he got the following answer. You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. How could man see the one who created the earth and the heavens and keep everything in existence? According to the teachings of St. Paul the Apostle, Old Testament law was only an image and prototype of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even in the Old Testament, God allowed Israelites to make sanctified symbolic objects, which the Israelites did indeed, but never considered them as deities, nor identified them with the living God. Orthodox Christians serve the triune God who is depicted on the icon and worshipped him only as opposed to an idol which is an expression of something non-existent and false. Paragons of idols are invented and are not real while the Christian icon is always a representation of something truthful, real and filled with God's uncreated energies. Christian icons, which make the continuation of the Old Testament mosaic legislation, have a two-way character. On the one hand, along with the word, they translate, interpret, and testify to man the secret of divine revelation. And on the other, transfer to man God's immaterial grace. The history, the second tradition, and archaeology testify to us that even in the earliest church, iconographic representations of biblical themes were in use, themes relating to the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples. Christian art in the narrow sense, iconography with the Christian content of God-revealed truths appears in about AD 200 at Dura Europas, an ancient Roman military settlement in eastern Syria. Preserved are remains of the baptistry with Christian wall paintings. Many of the preserved wall paintings from the third century in the Roman catacombs and stone carvings on the sarcophagi of the prominent Romans testify that the classical traditions had been accepted in the early Christian art, but then it transformed into something different, something new. The holy tradition preserved from oblivion the fact that the oldest icon not made with hands, with representation of the image of Jesus Christ, is the well-known image not made with hands. That is, a towel with the image of Christ, received from Christ by Middle Eastern ruler Abagaris of Edessa. According to another traditional testimony, the evangelist Luke is mentioned as the first iconographer who painted the image of Jesus Christ and the most holy Theotokos. When talking about painting in the early church, we can say that the situation in the art was the same as the theology and in divine service. Christianity had transcended capabilities from understanding and accepting such a dogma of both the Jewish culture of the time and the Greco-Roman world, founded on quite different bases. 
Then, just as it is the case now, it was not easy to accept preaching of the resurrected Son of God, the Theanthropos, to prepare the people little by little for the truly unattainable mystery the church first spoke to them in a language that was easier to understand than a direct image. Fish was one of the most common early Christian symbols, not only because the Greek word ichtis for fish hid the initial letters of the form Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Savior, but also because the mysterious traits of the fish St. Ambrose of Milan tells Christians to imitate fish, which, regardless of the storms and the waves, swim in the sea, and nothing can sink them. The phoenix, but also the peacock, symbolized resurrection in the early Christian art. Pigeon and dove were interpreted as symbols of the soul, the spirit. Holy gifts consecrated at the Eucharist were kept for later in special tabernacles in the form of a dove. In the beginning, Christ is often depicted symbolically as the good shepherd, beardless young man carrying a lost and then found sheep on his shoulders. This symbolical representation relied on stories from the Gospel and on the Psalms. He was also quite symbolically represented in the form of the Lamb of God, as he was announced in the symbolical pictures by the prophets of the Old Testament and how St. John the Baptist greeted him. But we find him as a young man in the narrative scenes painted on the walls of Roman tombs. It's true that in ancient time the bodies and the indescribable God is not pictured. Now, however, when he appeared in the flesh and lived with people, depicted is that which is visible about God. Indescribable God and the Lord describes, depicts himself by his incarnation. St. Basil the Great, for whom God is a great artist, is one of the first fathers who expounds a theological justification for the existence of the painted icons made with hands in the first centuries of Christianity. In Christianity, Jesus Christ began to be iconically depicted in the form in which his contemporaries had seen and experienced him, or rather, in the form in which he announced himself to the world. One should note that on an icon of Christ Orthodox icon painters never represent Christ as an ordinary, mortal and helpless man. Rather, they always portray him as a God-man in glory, even at the time of his utmost abasement.
iconic representation, the imaging of Jesus Christ, does not depend on the art, painting, or artistic skill, but above all, depends on the truthfulness of birth of the Word of God in the human body. The iconoclasts could not find the strength to understand the mystery of the dogmatists of Jesus Christ, the Theanthropos, and the consequence was taking a negative attitude towards the holy icons. Later examples of such iconoclasts are the Protestants. Modern Western civilization, which has long been defined as civilization of the image, is to a large extent marked by the Protestant failure in the assessment of icons due to many occurrences and superstitions and fallacies linked to the distorted forms of respecting of icons. The Protestants have given up veneration of icons altogether. And so, in recent history, not only that with the aid of science, there has been a disenchantment of the world, and in the ending of the view of the world as being a God's creation, but also a Protestant contribution to humanity largely eclipsed the perspective of the path to God. Communication with God was frustrated. Cessation of reading of icons has led to the closure of the window to the other world. Orthodox Christians have throughout history kept the knowledge of the fact that icon painting of Christ does not adjourn his natures, divine and human, nor does it equalize them, in which case the man would, so to speak, disappear in God, which historically was often the spiritual problem of the East. But it also does not separate the divine from human nature, which would have the effect that a man gradually eclipses God spiritual problem typical with the West. The Byzantine Emperor Constantine V was under the influence of the Jewish, that is to say, the Semitic teaching the teachings of other ancient peoples which identify the name with the bearer of the name, the object itself, which became the foundation of the teaching of the opponents of icons in the Byzantine Emperor, the iconoclasts. And several decades later, before the reign of Constantine V, 691 AD to be precise, the 5th 6th Ecumenical Council took the decision to prescribe not only that the Lord Jesus Christ is to be represented in icons and frescoes, but that he is always to be represented as a man, that is to say realistically, instead of an ancient allegorical and symbolical representations in the guise of a lamb. In the Orthodox Christian Church, iconically depict the face of the Incarnate One, of the Word of God, of the God-man Jesus Christ, because they want to see His likeness. By looking at Him, they are receiving sanctification, because He is truly and personally present in the holy icons made with hands. To the famous Serbian theologian, 
Father Justin Popovich too, incarnation of God is the greatest event after the creation of the world and man. As the creation of man, God framed his image, his icon in the human body, and what was received was a godlike being. Man and the incarnation, God himself, enters into man, becomes a man, and received was the Theanthropos, God. The goal of the human existence is indicated and here achieved in full. The basic error of most iconoclasts is that they try to interpret the Christianological dogma by reason and logical evidence, that is, based on the philosophical method. A great defender of icons and icon dualism, St. John of Damascus said that iconoclasts did not just fight against the icons, but primarily against the saints. They did so because they do not believe in the truth of the incarnation of the Word of God and the actual acceptance, assumption of human nature into the person of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. St. John of Damascus concludes that since the Word of God incarnated, the orthodox iconduals do not err when they show his likeness. And I saw the human image of God, says St. John, and saved is my soul. Origen, a great teacher, but also for those who careless and reluctant to check their conclusions against the church tradition, often also as an instigator of theological wondering. Bear in mind the resurrection of Christ was among the first to ask the following question. Is not Christ now glorified? Is it not now his earthly form transfigured, immortalized, incorruptible? How would anyone dare to paint an icon of this miraculous and unattainable form? if divine and spiritual essence could even be called for. Holy tradition recorded that after the resurrection, the apostles had seen Jesus Christ with the body and not without a body, which means that even after the resurrection, he was visible and tangible. Orthodoxy has historically closely minded to keep itself away from the Gnostic aberrations in which matter was perceived as sinful as shackles to the soul in this world. The book of Genesis preserved God's words that the whole of creation was created to be good. The fact that creation, through the first race of people, drifted away from God, trying to derive its existence from itself, led to the deterioration of matter, flesh, and therefore to death and evil. The birth of God in the human flesh returned to the flesh and the physicality, their dignity. The body is also a temple of the Holy Spirit. And in the promised all around resurrection at the end of history, to resurrect are both the body and the soul together. According to Orthodox teaching, Christ's human nature lost nothing after the resurrection and the ascension but as it is seen in the holy icons, it is visible and describable. But incorruptible, imperishable. He was seen as such by the holy apostles, to whom he appeared on several occasions.
The icon depicts a theanthropic hypostasis, person of Jesus Christ, with all the features and that characterizes his defied human nature. This nature does not exist separate from his hypostasis. By incarnation, the Lord received himself to the human essence. And by transfiguration on Mount Tabor, he showed the original beauty of the image. Of particular importance for the salvation of every man is the fact according to which the Church of Christ, his mystical body, the same happens with every Christian man. In the communion with the triune God, all that is created, material, by receiving immaterial divine energy, grace, becomes deified, immortal, and remains to live in the ages of ages. By imagining the theanthropic figure of Jesus Christ, that is, that in which he was seen in the world and history, the Orthodox Church professes in the visible, aesthetic way, her faith in him as true God and true man, Theanthropos. Hence the work of church art in the Eastern Church are in fact interpretations and explanations of the divine revelation. God is perfectly incorporeal by nature. An angel, however, as well as the soul and the demon, compared with God, the only incomparable, represents bodies, and compared with material bodies, are bodiless. That is why God, because he did not want us to remain in complete ignorance of incorporeal beings, overlaid them with forms and images, icons, In analogy to our nature, he gave them body shapes that can be seen, granted only by the non-material sight of the mind. Theotokos of the Three Hands. Intercessor. All merciful. The Virgin Lactance. Tender Mercy. Praying. 
Kept in the richness of iconographic figures, the icons of the most holy Theotokos preserve in the unbroken procession since the ancient times, and a safeguard for us, a shortcut of communication with the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. In the Orthodox Church, and especially after the decision of the Council of Ephesus, the Virgin Mary, as a bond that connects the Old and New Testament, is always imaged on the throne with her son, Jesus Christ, the Divine Child, and never without him. That is, she is never depicted by herself, separately, autonomously, Church professes the truth that Virgin Mary is the birth giver of God because she gave birth to the incarnate God. It was from that moment that he became visible and tangible, palpable. The indescribable Lord, by incarnating, described himself in flesh. A church song, a contakia, to the Holy Mother of God, laconically and succinctly expresses the whole truth about the issue. Indescribable word of the Father has become describable, becoming incarnate from you. The defiled image restored to the ancient state. He joined with the divine beauty. Confessing salvation, we image him in word and deed. Most Holy Theotokos, by begetting the Theanthropos Christ of our Lord, in fact begot the Church, because it gave the body to the Church. Looking at the icon of Theotokos, the Orthodox Christian clearly sees and experiences the truth that the Holy Mother of God, Christ, carried out his plan of salvation of man and the world. Virgin Mary is truly a new Eve. As the old Eve believed in the serpent in Eden and gave birth to death, so the new Eve, the Virgin Mary, freely believed in the angel and begot the Redeemer. We could say that in the icon of the Most Holy Theotokos, Virgin Mary is depicted not only as a mother of Christ, but also as a mother of the entire Christian kind and the members of the mystical body of Christ, the Church. By viewing an icon of the most holy Theotokos and by honoring it, Orthodox Christians enter into a direct spiritual union with the Incarnate, crucified, resurrected and glorified Word of God, Jesus Christ. In this way, the icon of Theotokos becomes a scale and a bridge of spiritual ascent of man into the triune God. However, the iconoclists rejecting the possibility of the iconic depiction representation of Jesus Christ had simultaneously rejected the orthodox teaching of him as the true son of the most holy Theotokos. Icons of the saints testify and confirm that the characters represented, imaged, in icons made with hands, participate in the immaterial glory of God. Representation of the holy, the saints, with Jesus Christ and the most holy Theotokos in icons made with hands clearly tell us of a man as a Catholic and a church being. Catholicity is emphasized everywhere, which shuns alienation, loneliness, and autonomy. But in this Catholicity, 
one never loses the freedom of a human personality. Rather, the person in the community is recognized and fortified. Just as the Orthodox icons portray Jesus Christ as a Theanthropus, the new Adam, so too the saints appear as deified and Christ-made persons. They are Christian people who experience the eternal reality in history and time. That is, just as they suffered with Christ, with Christ they resurrected and became celebrated. Looking at the iconic representation of the holy, in the icons made with hands, we become aware that our life is inseparable from theirs because only with all saints do we enter the kingdom of heaven. Accepting the possibility of the iconic depiction Jesus Christ, the most holy Theotokos and the saints is an expression of theological and anthropological teaching of the Orthodox Church. By representing, depicting the theanthropic image of Jesus Christ, ergo the image in which he was seen in the world and history, the Orthodox Church professes in the visible, aesthetic way its faith in him as true God and true man, the Theanthropos, God-man. Icons show that in the Church of Christ, his mystical body, God through his immaterial energy spiritually reconstructs man. Although he remains within the limits of his creative nature, the spiritually reconstructed and deified man is redeemed from slavery of deterioration, evil and death. In connection with the theme of the icon, initial dialogue had been conducted between the Christians and the Judeans. And later, after the appearance of iconoclasm, the dialogue was expanded and led between the iconduals and the iconoclasts. For the ancient church, iconoclasm was a large-scale challenge. History has shown that the struggle with the iconoclasm had in fact been a struggle for orthodoxy. The iconduals condemned the iconoclast for heresy. 
while the iconoclasts considered themselves bearers of enlightenment and accused icon jewels of the alleged fall into idolatry. Both primarily invoke the text of the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament, but also the priestly tradition. Due to the severe interference of ordinary civil government in internal affairs and teaching of the church, Pope Gregory II, first half of the 8th century, openly told Emperor Leo III that doctrinal issues are not a matter for king and emperors, but a matter for the bishops. Leo III is Zarian, aimed to remove any obstacles to unity of Christians, Jews and Muslims in his empire which was one of the main reasons that he took a negative attitude toward the holy icons. In his letter addressed to Pope Gregory II, Leo III says of himself, I am the emperor and the prelate. To which, in defense of holy icons, John of Damascus commented, saying, That is, my brothers, a brigand attack. We are obedient to you, O Emperor, in matters relating to this life, in matters of this century, in taxes, the exercise and the like, in what is your area of administration in earthly affairs. However, in the church hierarchy, we have shepherds to tell us the word and to establish the church law. The iconoclasts primarily fought against the theology of icon and in this way were undermining the foundations of basic truths of the Orthodox faith and life of the Church. There is also an opinion that the cause of iconoclasm is the conflict between the Greek thought and the Middle East Asian thought and spirit. Hostility towards the holy icons flamed in Asia Minor provinces of the Byzantine Empire and solidified in some circles of the Byzantine clergy. By Emperor Leo III's ascension into iconoclasm in the 1720s, iconoclasm became the ruling teaching of the Byzantium state. The appearance of iconoclasm caused huge unrest in Byzantium. There were terrible conflicts and persecutions. Church of Christ had suffered many martyrs. The iconoclastic stance was also adopted by the successor of Leo III, Emperor Constantine V. Removal of the holy icons from the Christian churches began in 1726, while the iconoclasm in the true sense of the word began when Leo III issued an edict against the cult of icons. However, a particular disastrous event for the Iconduals was the Iconoclastic Council that was convened by Emperor Constantine V in 754. The council made a unanimous decision on the inability of the iconic representation of Jesus Christ, and therefore the rejection of the holy icons made with hands. Many researchers believe that the Emperor Constantine V was under the influence of Eastern peoples, primarily the people who lived in the region of Mesopotamia, but also under the influence of Islam. The concept of image, icon, in the understanding of iconoclasts denotes something entirely different in relation to the understanding of iconduals. Since the iconoclasts, a true icon, can be considered to be only something that is identical to the ancient model, its archetype. Hence, they could only recognize Eucharist as Christ's icon.
He ordered that, as an image we take the chosen select material, that is, the substance from which bread is made, which does not represent a human form, so as to avoid idolatry. If for the iconoclasts, image was just that which was identical with its archetype, then they could indeed declare the Eucharist as the only image of Christ. And for the Orthodox, the Eucharist could not be an image, exactly because it was considered identical to the model, the archetype. With Holy Communion is only the body and blood of Lord Jesus Christ. This is the profound difference that principally separated these two parties. The problem of iconoclasm is in fact a deeper conflict about a lasting and comprehensive meaning of religion, art, beauty, and the liturgy. For the holy icons in the Church of Christ, the incarnate Theanthropos are the works of art and monuments. But also much more than that, they are doctrines of the Christian faith, faith in the lasting and timeless meaning of the God-likeness of the human image and Christ-like personality of the saints as true people. The first such true image was promulgated truly by Christ himself, and therefore the key to the whole dispute was a matter of Christ's icon. Having a negative attitude toward dead matter, the iconoclasts were unsubstantiated in identifying icondulism with idolatry. Today, in the Protestant world, the iconoclastic practice continues, so that in the current theological dialogue one feels the echo of iconoclastic attitudes and tendencies inherited from the history of the early church. The Western civilization has lost the sense of the icon. It degraded the icon and brought exactly that which iconoclasm, but also the Reformation was trying to eschew, a new idolatry. This guy's selling smoke. Wrap it up, Ev. The name of the agent is Evelyn Salt. My name is Evelyn Salt. According to the Orthodox teaching, idolatry is obscience to a creation. Instead of God the Creator, that is, adoration of matter, to the idols made of matter, or obscience to beings to which the idols refer. Icondulism has nothing to do with idolatry. Those who want to represent only Christ's human nature say that iconoclast sins against the dogma of the inseparability of the two natures. But if someone wants to represent on icon both natures of Christ, then he sins and commits a crime with his blasphemous wantonness, wanting to represent a divinity that cannot be represented. The visual representation of Christ is in general impossible because it contradicts the basic religious dogma. So say the iconoclast. For the orthodox icondules, it is simply inconceivable that a picture and that which is shown on it should be the same. The Seventh Ecumenical Council, AD 787, passed special decisions on the issue of icondulism. By fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the icon sanctifies the eyes of those who gaze at it and elevates their mind towards the mystical knowledge of God. We, the Orthodox, received from the Apostles and the Fathers a commitment to bow before the holy icons and kiss them, 
because that is the meaning of these words. In the ancient Greek dialect, to bow is to love and kiss. For if someone loves something, he bows to it. That is, kisses and cherishes it, as it is shown by our human relations, when we treat our friends with attention and love. The Orthodox view is that the veneration of sacred icons is based on one hand, on a God-revealed truth that the true in God created man in his image, out of sheer love, and on the other, that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, God the Logos, incarnated, was begotten in the human body. Thus in his theanthropic person merged the prototype, God, and the type, image man. It is in the union of the prototype and the image one may see the sense of creation, of the world, and the man in it as the crown of God's creation. Iconoclasm was an attack on God's plan for the salvation as a whole, not on some of its individual aspects. As this complex heresy was an attack on orthodox doctrine in its entirety, the renewal of icondulism is not only victory over one particular heresy, but a victory of orthodoxy as such. The church has defeated a multitude of various heresies, and it is yet to defeat them. However, only one of its victories, namely the victory over iconoclasm, was declared the victory of orthodoxy. The Orus of Faith, that is the exposition of the Orthodox faith, a statement of determination agreed at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, particularly emphasizes this truth. We affirm that we preserve all the traditions of the Church which have been decreed to us in her, whether written or unwritten, without innovation, of which one is the formation of representative images, which is perfectly concordant with the history of the evangelical preaching unto the ensurance of the true and not the imaginary incarnation of God the Word, and which is of service to us unto a like edification. For those things which are naturally illustrative of each other and most indubitably possess the outward appearance of each other. However, even after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, at the beginning of the 9th century, iconoclasm reappears owing to the policies of some Byzantium emperors. So it was until Empress Theodora and Patriarch of Constantinople, Methodius, finally legalized and restored honoring of the holy icons on the 11th of March, 843. The event is dedicated at the first Sunday of Easter, or the Great Lent, which concludes the first seven days of this intensified prayer and the ascetic contrition, and which is dubbed the Sunday of Orthodoxy. In this ceremony, the Holy Church celebrates not only the victory over iconoclasm, but the victory of the Holy Orthodoxy in general, its triumph over heresies, false teachings and divisions. Sunday of Orthodoxy could be called the birthday of obscience, veneration and the theology of icons. Veneration of holy icons for the West was only a pious habit, while the Byzantine holy icons are inseparable from the liturgy and the sacramental life of Orthodox Christians.
Saint John of Damascus argues there are several kinds of worship. According to him, the first type of worship is obedience to God, which we offer to the one who is the only naturally worthy of worship, the one God, and this we do in many ways. Firstly, to him all creatures bow as servants to their master. Another way is the way of admiration and longing for God, with which we make obeisance to God for his natural glory, for he is the only one glorified, because he is himself the cause of all glory and all good. The third way is the way of thanksgiving for the good that has occurred for our sake. The fourth way is the way of privation and hope for charity and goodwill, by which we know that without him we cannot do or have anything good. The fifth way is the way of repentance and confession, because when we sin we bow to God, praying for forgiveness of sins. St. John of Damascus says that worship is a symbol of awe, love and honor, obedience and humility. However, the Holy Father warns that no one should worship anyone other than the one natural God. Others can be given only that which belongs to them for the sake of the Lord. In short, Orthodox iconduals do not worship substance of which the icon is made. Expressing the pan-Orthodox doctrine of the veneration of holy icons, John of Damascus is categorical. I do not bow to the matter but to the maker of matter, one that has become matter for my sake, and deigned to settle in the matter, and he who through matter achieved salvation for me. But I do not respect matter as God. God forbid, for how can God be that which is created out of nothing. By explaining his thought, the Holy Fathers added that we worship both natures of Christ because united with his flesh is also his divinity. Orthodox Christian worships and serves the only living God while completely different respect is shown to God's creatures, the saints. They had as much as possible complied with God, but their free will and God's settlement and cooperation in immaterial grace. They can truly be called gods, but not by nature, but by adoption, by grace. As is the red-hot iron called fire, but not by nature, but by adoption and acceptance of fire. We worship them as those who have been glorified by God as servants of God and the liturgists, and as those who are out of love for Him gain courage. John of Damascus states that we worship them because this is in the service to the Church. According to the wise deduction of another great defender of icons, Saint Theodore of Studion, just as the admiration veneration of icons exalts and transfers onto the prototype to Christ, so too it comes back from the prototype onto the icon made with hands. The Holy Father communicates that we should believe that divine grace comes down on it, and it provides consecration to those who approach it with faith. In icons made with hands, Christians can see sacred characters as miracle makers and pray to God to make them participants in those goods enjoyed by the holy. So there is a likely conversion between a Christian man and the prototype based on which the images were made. 
In Slavic language, the word image is understood to originate from the words of the likeness, of the image. Since then, love makes the core of the orthodox iconulism. An orthodox Christian hence approaches an icon with awe, but also with a kiss and obscience. Here we will just add that the communion of man through icons made with hands with his prototype takes place directly only when it comes to icons of Christ. But when it comes to respecting the icons of the Holy Theotokos, and the saints, then it is a relative and mediating communion with the triune God. The Orthodox do not forget that a man with a deep faith approaches Christian truths shall receive a great prize. And he who hesitates, resembling a wave of sea driven by the wind and turbulent, he shall receive nothing. In short, a miracle takes place at this point, not a magic act, as some iconoclasts claim without basis. The Oros, that is the exposition of the faith of the Holy Fathers by the Seventh Ecumenical Council, keeps in the clearest fashion the decisions of the honorific obeisance given to the holy icons and paying of respect to them. We make obscene respect and with love kiss the all-honorable icon of the human incarnation of the Word of God, Christ, anointed by God, remaining unchanged, so that he who is anointed believes with faith to see in the icon the very God, who appeared in the body and lived with people. We make obscience and we give honor to the icon of the most holy Theotokos and to icons of the all-honorable God's saints, raising the eyes of our souls to the image of the prototype and raising our minds to the unimaginable and unutterable. Such icondulism, in which the core is the living triune, has nothing in common with idolatry, because idolatry occurs only when there is honor to be given to the character, prototype, original, that is depicted on the icons. However, Orthodox icondules do not divide the icon from his prototype. It would be useful to emphasize the fact that the iconographer fails to faithfully represent, depict the prototype on an icon made with hands. This poses no obstacle to Christians to pay due respect to it because veneration of the icon does not relate to that which is missing, but relates to that which identifies the icon with the prototype original. In a word, we worship only the triune God and serve Him. While we pay due respect to the characters painted in icons made with hands because through them, as living and spiritual ties, or by intermediation, we arrive into the arms of God. Icondulism is an expression of orthodox faith and Christian love. It could be called a loving testimony. Orthodox Christians respect the substance from which the icons are made of because it is filled with the divine power and grace that makes them miraculous. Saint John of Damascus 
asks a sobering question. Is it not matter, the beautiful and thrice blessed wood of the crucifix? Or is it not matter, the honorable and sacred mound, the place of Golgotha, crucifixion? Or is it not matter, the life-giving and life-bearing stone, the holy sepulchre, the source of our resurrection? Or are they not matter, the ink and the most holy book of the gospel? Is it not matter the life-giving tabernacle which gives us the bread of life? Or is it not matter the gold and the silver used to make crosses, plates and cups? Or above all this, is it not matter the body and blood of my Lord? Therefore, either reject admiration and respect to all of this, or give way to church tradition, or give way to church tradition, and venerate icons of God and the friends of God by the grace of the Spirit of God. Do not call the matter evil, because it is not dishonorable. Anything that God created is not dishonorable. Only that is dishonorable which is caught. Only that is dishonorable which has no cause in God, but in our fancy. By free movement and aspiration of will, from that which is natural into that which is unnatural. And that is exactly what sin is.
In clashes with the iconoclasts in the 8th and 9th century AD, the Orthodox had proven a veneration of the icons may in no terms be equated with idolatry. The struggle for icons was actually a struggle for basic truths of the Orthodox faith. The struggle to preserve the truth of God's salvific incarnation in the human flesh. In the many iconoclastic conflicts, numerous icon defenders had suffered martyrdom. Countless icons were destroyed. After the victory of Orthodoxy, which the Church celebrates each year at the end of the first Sunday of Great or Easter Lent, iconography in the Byzantine Empire experienced a boom. The theological foundation for the masterpieces of religious art produced in the course of subsequent centuries in the Byzantium had been sent in this heroic period of defense of icons. Some of the most important knowledge on icons was left to us by St. John of Damascus and St. Theodore of Studion. Their preserved writings helped us to better understand the mysterious sacred images. St. John of Damascus writes, The first type of icon is natural. Everything must first possess that which is natural to it. The second type of icon is the notion in God of his future creation. By his will, what he pre-eternally conceived happens, that which is set to happen in the time he predetermined. Saint Dionysus the Aeropygite called them predeterminations. A third type of icon is the one that God created by imitation, that is man. God himself in the book of Genesis says to create man in the image, icon and our likeness. Adding, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the whole of the earth to be a master. The fourth kind of icon occurs when the scripture creates forms, characters and representations of invisible and incorporable things, physically depicted for at least some understanding of God and the angels, because we are not able to conceive that which is incorporeal, without image that suits our understanding. Dakle, 
How then the divine word cannot depict that which by its very nature is formed by paragraphs? That for which man longs, but is not able to see, because it is not present. Gregory the Diologist says that no matter how much effort the mind, unable to leave the corporality, sensuality, but that which is invisible on God since creation of the world, can be realized by mind is in his creatures, says the Apostle in the Epistle to the Romans. We see image, icons and creatures. So, for example, it is said that the Holy Trinity without beginning is reflected through the sun, the light and sunshine, or through the source, the river that comes out from it, and the very flow of it. Or, the mind and the word and our spirit. Or a rose, the flower and its fragrance. The fifth type of icon is called one that predepicts and augurs to the future events, such as the bush in the book of Exodus. Now Moses was tended the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And in the book of Judges, the Jew that fell on the fleece, that augurs virgin the Theotokos, as well as the Scepter in the Book of Numbers. So Moses spoke to the Israelites, and the leaders gave him twelve staffs, one for the leader of each of their ancestral tribes, and Aaron's staff was among them. Moses placed the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. The next day, Moses entered the tent of the testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the house of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed and produced almonds. Thus the snake in the book of Numbers prophesied those who destroyed the all-cunning snake and the sea, water and the cloud refer to the spirit of baptism. The sixth type of icons, these are the images that represent the memory of the events or miracles or virtues for the glory and honor and celebration of virtuous and excellent people, or an image of a prophet for the victory over and shame to the wicked people, for the later benefit for those who are deified, so as to avoid evil and be zealous in the goodness. This type of icon is twofold. It is written in the books by words, because the letter forms the word, as God has inscribed the law on the tablets. And he ordered that lives of God-loving people be recorded, also through viewing with senses. We now lovingly paint the icons by virtue of the decorated people, their zeal and our memory and co-zeal.
The God-inspired fathers teach that an icon should be viewed in two dimensions. One dimension relates to the icon, which Saint Basil the Great refers to as a natural icon or a born icon. And the second dimension refers to the so-called icon made with hands, an icon by form. A natural icon is in essence identical with its ancient model, prototype. A natural icon is understood to mean Jesus Christ because he is the icon of the non-inferable God and shows that which is hidden, e.g. He, the Son of God, as an icon testifies to the divinity of God the Father and shows God the Father. According to his divinity, the incarnated Word of God, Jesus Christ, as a natural icon of God the Father. In this case, the image and the prototype have one and the same nature. Divine, but they are different hypostatically. That is, they are different hypostases. Such resemblance exists between father and son, and every man is a natural icon, image, of his father and his mother, with whom is identified by substance and is distinguished by his personality. As the father is in the son, and the son is in the father, then the prototype and the icon are inseparable one from another. The incarnate son of God, therefore, presents in himself God the Father, so that we see the Father in the sun. Patristic thoughts that no one else has seen the nature of God, just the reflection and the icon image of that which will happen in the future, precisely because of the existence of such a relationship. We can talk about the divine knowledge of the Holy Trinity, as well as the liturgical and the pedagogical and the educational significance of the holy icons, which have been given to us by the Son of God, the natural icon of God the Father, by becoming incarnate and entering the world and history. An icon made with hands does not exist by itself. It is not autonomous, but directly depends on the character depicted in the icon who gives the icon its value in return. And therein lies the meaning of why icons exist. The icon made with hands we could characterize as a visible link, a sacred bridge between the invisible prototype and the faithful man, by which man enters into a living communion with a triune God. God gave to a Christian man the immaterial grace so that the immaterial sight of his mind, he could comprehend the invisible reality through the icon made with his hands. In this sense, the icon serves as a wonder-making living mirror. Unlike natural icon, in which the prototype and the icon are essentially equalized, but are different in hypostases, the father and the son, and so due to one and the same divine nature of the Godhead, there are no two gods, but one God. With the icon made with hands, things are quite different.
Identification is made only because of the similarity that exists between the icon and its real paragon. Of particular importance for the understanding of icons made with hands is the fact that they always represent and portray historical figures. Jesus Christ or the saints, with certain characteristics and iconographers, never paint imaginary nor non-existent person. As for the representation of celestial beings, angels, one should say the following. Even though they are invisible spiritual beings, they still can be visually depicted because they existed in history, in the human form, and thus were visible. It is natural to depict bodies with shapes and physical description and color. Angels, however, and the soul and the demons also by their nature are shaped and described, although not physically and bluntly. Because since they are spiritual, it is believed that the places of the spirit, they are present and active, and they are visually represented in their physicality, in the manner in which they appear to the worthy. But the physical image indicates an incorporeal and spiritual vision. For the prophets and those to who these persons and phenomena reveal have to watch them not with physical but with spiritual eyes. Not everything was visible to everyone. Simply put, we can paint icons of all the characters and phenomena which we have seen and conceive them in a manner in which they have occurred. Sometimes it transpires that from the words we understand characters and occurrences. However, to the understanding of them, we come based on what we have seen. Icons owe their existence to the original. In this way, icon made with hands on one hand testifies about the true presence of the prototype in the icon. And on the other hand, the icon shows a living and graceful communion that exists between the prototype and the man who venerates the icon. Any waiver of icons made with hands signifies waiver of their prototypes. The orthodox view is that there is an unbreakable connection between the icon and the prototype. That is, between an image and its prototype based on which the icon made with hands was created by way of imitation. In other words, the icon owes its existence on the one hand due to its model, on the other hand, the meaning of the icon is consistent in its relation to its role model. So, the holy icon and its paragon communicate between each other on a level of cause and cause reality. That is, they are inextricably linked to each other by invisible threads by which honor, respect and prayers of the faithful are carried to the saints, to the Theotokos, to Christ.
During history, there has been disagreement over the issues of how Prototype and the Icon communicate. Without the Prototype, the Icon does not work. In a word, the Icon is that which has its relationship to the Prototype and that which is caused by the prototype. Of particular importance is the fact that the holy icons are not the product of art, but they are facts and events. The reality that emerged with the incarnation of the Word of God. Who entered history as true and real man. The common name of the icon and the original. Christians observe it is through the name of the Holy Spirit consecrates the icon by uncreated energies. And thus the name of the icon jointly, liturgically, elevate Christians into living community with the original. Therefore, by their name, Icons acquire the might of their prototype, elevates us to the holy prototype, first image, Christ, and then deified, redeemed, spiritually reshaped people, and people sanctified in divine grace. In this manner, between the prototype and man, icondual, an intellectual and loving dialogue, and communion takes place. According to the orthodox understanding, when Christians talk about the icon, the Theanthropos Jesus Christ, they can simultaneously speak of the icon of Christ and of Christ. They can do so because the name of the icon is in the same relationship with the original in which the icon itself is. But one should know that there is no natural union between Christ's deity and his icon made with hands. God sanctifies an icon through his uncreated energies and through an icon Christians receive consecrating God's blessing. Therefore, the God-man Jesus Christ is by his name, that is, by his person, hypostatically present on his icon. Though, through his icon made with hands, Christians are provided a possibility to spiritually rise up to him and to spiritually grow by the grace of Christ's fullness. The iconograph's character embodies the spiritual truth displayed by the icons. The fact is that the material which was made into icons with hands has the role of insecticides Christian society through which leads to knowledge of the real and true their strengthened model, the original with whom he enters into a spiritual community. Orthodox Christians are not silent observers of icons made with hands, but they are living and personal interlocutors with the living characters represented in icons made with hands. An Orthodox Christian is invited to lead a living and spiritual conversation with the image, name of the icon, and thus overcome his loneliness and become a Catholic being, sanctified by divine grace, a being of the community of the Church.
It is exactly in this that the liturgical and pedagogical character and significance of the icon can be seen in the church and the Christian culture, as well as its role in the elevation of Christians towards the kingdom of God. The Holy Scripture of the Old Testament conceives and interprets a name as an expression of an inner state, of a being and its reflection on the personality of the holder of the name. 
In the book of Job, one passage says, There were no kind of people with no name, less valuable than the land. In ancient Greece, the name was an extension of the person. In addition, the ancient Greeks believed that the name was a magical force and that the name determines the fate of its bearer. Philo of Alexandria believes that personal names of the Old Testament express the nature of the person. And he interprets them allegorically. In names, Philo always looked for a deeper meaning. Relying on biblical sources in the sacred tradition, the fathers and ecclesiastical writers believe that the name depicts a personality behind it. In the Holy Scriptures, the name is understood as a genuine expression of the named object or the named person. To find out what anyone's name represents by linking it to its carrier means exactly to know the carrier's inner being. In the Bible, the name is virtually identified with the personality of its holder. The glory of his name signifies the glory of its holder, while shame to the name means detriment to its holder due to the damage of his dignity. Collapse of the name signifies the collapse of its holder. The Holy Fathers reveal that it was a time when there was no name for God, and there will be a time when there will be no names for Him. These words indicate that no name of God is co-eternal with Him, that unlike God, all names have a beginning and an end. The name of God is understood as an expression of the glory of God. God's glory acts in the name of God and through the name of God. Also, one should say that the knowledge of the name Yahweh was identified with worship to the true God. Considering that the ignorance of God's name meant worship of false gods. Among the Jews, the sense of the size of the name of God was so strong that the Tetragrammaton, YHWH, was not pronounced in the synagogue in an audible voice. The name of the Almighty was a terrible force. No one dared mention it. The Jewish understanding of the name was carried over to the New Testament. The demons are driven out, and the people healed by the name of our Lord Christ, because this name is a force. Jesus Christ is mercy and truth of God, as is the name of the Father. The Son of God is the glory of the name of God, that is, of the Father, due to which the Apostle calls him reflection of the Father's glory. Those people who live daily as disciples in Christ's name receive the gifts they deserve. Enlightening through Christ's name, one receives the spirit of reason, another that of vision, the third that of force. Some receive the gift of healing, some other the gift of leadership, some the gift of learning, some the gift of fear of God. 
The name of Jesus rests in the center of all the liturgical life of the Christian Church. One of the most famous prayers in Orthodoxy is the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Although usually associated with the deepest Orthodox mysticism, the prayer of Jesus is not reserved only for the particularly dedicated monastic orders. <laughs> On the contrary, it is used by all who long for Christ, and it allows everyone to communicate with Him, regardless of education and age. As the foundation of spiritual life, it is recommended for all and everywhere. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, He can be uttered once or more times at specific times during the day which would otherwise remain unfulfilled in the spiritual sense. For example, when we run an usual and routine errand, when we get dressed, when we wash dishes, when we do the fields, when we take a walk or when we drive, while waiting for the bus or in a traffic jam, at some quiet time before some unpleasant or burdensome conversation, if we cannot fall asleep or before we are fully awakened. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Son, Christ of God, Son of God, have mercy on you. The special value of Jesus' prayer is that it is basically simple. It can be done when more complex prayers are impossible. It is of a particular use in moments of terrible tension and great pressure. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Pomiluj me, Bože, po velikoj milosti svojoj i pobjelo milosrđu svom, očisti bezakonje moje. Operi me dobro od bezakonja moga i od greha moga očisti me, jer bezakonja svoja ja znam i grehe moj stalno preda mnom. We cannot accurately assess the significance of Jesus' prayer for the spirituality of orthodoxy without feeling the power and might which the divine name holds in itself. If the Jesus prayer is more gracious than others, the reason is that it contains the name of God and it is based on the very name of God. The name of the Son of God is great and boundless and upholds the entire universe, is written in Hernius, Shepherd, one of the oldest Christian books. Jer bezakonja svoja ja znam i grehe moj stalno preda mnom, tebi jedino me se greših i zlo pred tobom učinih, a ti si pravedan u rečima svojim i čist u sudu svome. Gle u bezakonjima se začeh i u gresima rodi me mati moja, gle istinu ljubiš i javljaš mi nepoznatosti i tajne sve mudrosti svoje, pokropi me isopom i očistit ću se, umim je i bit ću velji od snega, Daj mi da slušam radost i veselje, da se prenu kosti potrvene, odvrati lice svoj od grehova mojih i sve bezakonja moja očisti. Srce čisto sagradi u meni, Bože, i duh pravo obnovi u meni. Ne odgurni me od lice Tvoga i duha Tvoga, sve Tvoga ne oduzmi od mene. When someone's name is called, that means the presence of his personality. The name comes alive as soon as it is recalled. A name instantly receives the soul of the one to whom it belongs. That is why so much importance is given to calling of the name. If this is true for names of the people, how much more worth is it for the name of God? The power and the beauty of God are present and active in His name. His name means divine presence. God is with us. Emmanuel.
It would be useful to emphasize here that, in fact, all names of God are to that extent relational and incomplete, that none of the individually, nor all of them together, do not allow us to comprehend what God is in His essence. If you collect all the names of God in the Holy Scripture and compile them into a whole, we get a partial representation based on fantasy, sooner an idol than God. God is fathomable and indescribable, unnameable. We can only describe some of His properties, but we cannot adequately describe the essence of God. The name written on the holy icons on the one hand associates the icon with its model and transfers onto God's grace and holiness. It consecrates it with the name of God and on the other hand helps the icon dual to properly understand which saintly person is depicted so that in this way we can eschew doubt and unwanted substitution of characters iconically depicted in icons. In Byzantium, there was no special art of consecration of icons. A moment of transformation of a picture into an icon was considered to be an application on corresponding inscription, that is, a name onto it. This, of course, did not mean that any artwork with the name of God or the name of a saint written on it automatically became an icon. Other requirements needed to be fulfilled, of which the main was the fidelity of the iconographer to the iconographic canon. However, an unlabeled icon created by all the rules of iconography was not understood to be a holy icon. Byzantian iconoclast said, Unholy foundation of the falsely called icons has no basis either in the teachings of Christ or the apostles, or in the patriotic tradition. There is also no priestly prayer that sanctifies them, so as to make them usual objects of the saints, yet they remain a constant everyday thing. To which the Icondules replied, Over many of such objects that we declare sacred, we do not read priestly prayers, because they are in the very name filled with holiness and grace. Thus, the very picture of the life-giving cross, though its consecration does not even rely on a separate prayer, we think is worthy of respect and serve us in sufficient means to obtain consecration. The same applies to icons. By labeling it with a certain name, we ascribe its honor to the prototype. By kissing it respectfully, making obscience to it, we receive consecration. Iconduals also relied on the words of St. John Chrysostom, on the paintings of Meletius and Antioch, whom the inhabitants of Antioch drew on rings, seals, rocks, glasses, the walls of the room, everywhere. Not only to listen to his holy name, but also to watch him everywhere. The size of his faith cannot be forgotten. Just one example, in the times of conflict between the Orthodox and the heretic Arians, 
When Saint Meletius spoke to the people in the church the divine trinity in unity, his own deacon, a heretic, ran to the bishop and abruptly shut his mouth with his fist. Saint Meletius, unable to speak, continued his testimony by raising his hand, firstly opening three fingers, then showing them to the people, and then clasped his hand and raised the clasped fingers. They say that the saint clasped fingers. A lightning broke out. Each symbol in the liturgical sense contains a certain presence of the symbolized. God is present in his name, the place of the highest epiphany. Both the name of God as well as the icon are identical in meaning, a link in the constructed religious thought of a series of symbols, which signify the one who is above names, the icons too, above all possible symbols. The symbol does not simply refer to a reality, but actually announces that reality, brings association with it. Reverence showed to the name of God ascends to God himself as the prototype of that name. In this sense, the seventh ecumenical council clarifies the issue. We do not recognize in the icon anything but the image that represents similarity to the prototype. Due to this, it gets its name. It is the only aspect by which it participates in the prototype and therefore it is respected and holy. Orthodoxy recognizes many miraculous icons. The faithful who prayed before these icons have experienced and still experience miraculous healings, reconciliation of people in feud, finding of lost family members. The icons helped during wartime invasions of foreign armies. Enormous significance in the Russian history was given to the famous Theotokos of Vladimir. And with the Serbs, the Theotokos with three hands, which is kept in the monastery Hilander at Mount Athos. This miraculous icon was given to Saint Sava, the first Serbian archbishop, at the monastery of Saint Sava, the sanctified in the Holy Land. The third hand of the icon was painted out of gratitude by St. John of Damascus after the miraculous healing of his hand, which had been cut off by order of the Damascus Caliph. The most famous miracle working icons are dedicated by specific dates in the church calendar. Orthodox view is that a miracle is not an act of magic, because the only living God can work in miracles which occur in the world by divine intervention. Holy icons made with hands display miracles made by spiritually transfigured holy men, but they do not make them with their own. It is rather God that works in miracles through his chosen ones.
A miracle is the expression of love, omnipotence, wisdom and thoughtfulness of a triune God on the entire creation. And especially on man as the crown of God's creation. Miracle is a reality that characterizes the Orthodox Church of Christ, and only in the Church a miracle is properly grasped. Among other things, the very incarnation of God the Logos, the Word of God, was a miracle by which humankind was declared that He is the Son of God. Each God's miracle contains in itself the salvific message and it's intended to bring the fallen man to the community with the triune God. He who does not understand the mystery of miracle can neither properly understand the mystery of the revelation of God or the mystery of the miraculous might of the sacred icons made with hands. The miraculous power of holy icons is a consequence of the philanthropy of God. Because in this way, the faith of icon duels in the living God is fortified. Among other things, we must not forget that miracles, which occur through holy icons, confirm the relationship between icons and their paragon. Hence, the holy icon made with hands has a miraculous power because it in itself possesses an iconic representation of its paragon. That is, it is the grace of God that does miracles, not the matter itself. A miracle, therefore, is not so much a supernatural thing as it is a sign, an omen, a symbolic form of revelation. Miraculousness of icons, in fact, points to signs of grace that have appeared through it, while the healing of the soul through the icon by contact with the spiritual word is, above all else, more necessary than everything else, the appearance of the miraculous aid. According to the Orthodox Christian teaching, all holy icons are miraculous because they possess God's immaterial grace. 
whereas it is erroneous to believe that only certain icons are miraculous. The presence of the grace of the Holy Spirit in icons made with hands makes them miraculous and holy, and this was precisely the reason for the opinion that icons needed to be consecrated by special act, such as prayer. Icons are already sacred because they are sanctified by the depicted image of the saint, which is to say by God through the image of the saint. The fact that some holy icons are called miraculous and others are not is closely connected with the faith of the Christian man and with the mystery of God's plan of salvation and not because, allegedly, certain holy icons are not miraculous. According to Orthodox teaching, holy icons are not soulless dead matter, as the iconoclasts are mistaken in thinking. They are God-chosen means through which the living, triune God enters a community, with man revealing to him that life is a miracle. crashing your way through trees Dualistic separation of the body and soul brought humanity in the 21st century on the threshold of a dangerous development The growth of the virtual reality hypertrophy of information and of the brain as their carrier the pursuit of science that everything perishable included the proteins of a living organism to be replaced by a more durable and lasting materials. All this threatens to call into question the very basis of humanity. Yeah, 
Western civilization, in its more modern individualistic form, tends to more and more protect a man from contact with another man. Contempt for a sense of touch as the most primordial of all the senses additionally prevents a man belonging to the Western civilization to accept the forgotten way of icondulism. Aristotle's words are also in other senses, man is behind many animals. And when it comes to touch, man far exceeds animals in the subtlety of this sense. It is exactly for this reason that man is the most reasonable living creature. Even though the icons express a view of superiority of spirit over body, the Orthodox have always kept away from the heretical contempt of the body. The fight for icons was the fight for the very basics of the faith, in their redeeming incarnation in the human body. Passion. and a resurrection of the Son of God. Iconoclasts have the dualistic view of the world, and in their anthropology they had rejected the importance of the human body. And as a consequence of it, was the rejection of the holy icons made with hands. Iconoclasts of today share the same standpoint. Iconduals comprehend man as a psychophysical and complete being. The entire man is found in unity, in the alliance of the soul and body. According to biblical anthropology, and that means also according to the patristic theology, man is a bilateral being who consists of two elements, the mortal body, which characterizes the man of the earth, and the mortal soul, which comprises the living and the life-giving force inside him. After the merging of body and soul, one cannot talk about them separately, as separate entities any longer because in the human personality, they are found in mysterious unity and are animated. This is expressed by the biblical term, and the man became a living soul. Regardless of the prejudices arising from the incorrect interpretation of ascetic literature, one cannot live a virtuous and ascetic life without the body. This truth of the unity of the human body and soul, that is of the integrity of the human individual, is iconically represented in the holy icons of the Orthodox Church. The church has always aspired that her art educate believers in the same way as its ministry. The 
church does not recognize the icon as the only one aspect of orthodox teaching, but rather an expression of orthodoxy in its entirety. According to patriastic teaching, the content of the Holy Gospel and the Holy Icons is the revelation of a new reality which followed the incarnation of the Word of God. That is, that followed his entry into the world and the human history. As a sacred image or figure, the icon is one way of profession of the church tradition, in parallel with the oral and the written tradition. Both holy icons and the gospel announce and bear witness to the same truth, except that in one case, profession is done by word, and in the other by paint. Because of this, holy icons made with hands are rightly called theology in color. Holy icons are intended for all Orthodox Christians, regardless of the level of their education, knowledge or their literacy and spiritual maturity. Seeing the holy image on an icon made with hands, an iconjuror becomes aware that the gift in the likeness, image of God, which exists in every human being, is directly connected to Christ. Because he gave to man an indelible seal, a being in the image of God. We are surprised by the fact that all man's value, and that which makes him worthy of respect, is found in the recognition of the existence of the image, likeness, of God in every human being. Holy icons manifest to us a visible way that God-likeness and Christ-likeness, that which makes man a man, a wonderful and God-like living person, valuable and capable of internal beauty and true eternal life in love with God and other people in the community of the Theanthropic Church, in community with Christ and his God-like brothers. Christians, by venerating sacred icons, respect the historical figures that are created in the image of God and during their life had come close to God. They enter into a live dialogue with them and are consecrated in that dialogue. Icons allow Christians to enter into communion with each other and into spiritual togetherness. Historicity of the painted characters and icons made with hands is of special significance to the Christian iconography. As we witness in the Rule 82 of the 5th, 6th Ecumenical Council, which indicates that symbolism is not completely rejected, rather that it is sent to the background. It actually indicates, though indirectly, the meaning of the ecclesiastical image. Icon is supposed to represent the human image of the incarnate God i.e. the historical image of Jesus Christ.
If, however, restrain ourselves only to the depiction of the savior as the common man, as does photography or the secular portrait art. Depiction will indicate only his life, suffering and death. of the ecclesiastical image or type. Likeness may not be limited by this, considering that the person represented differs from all other people. He is not just man. He is the Anthropos, Godman. In other words, the abasement of word of God, that is, his servant form, is to be shown to cause the understanding of his divine glory. It should be the image of his God, the Logos, through which we grasp what constitutes the deliverance of his death and the redemption of the world which resulted from it. not only in the subject matter, but also by the method it is expounded. Conjol addresses the prototype, and in this address one can see the exalting importance of holy icons. By receiving in himself the immaterial grace of the Holy Spirit, man can once again become a true icon of God. In other words, man becomes conformed to the image of the Son of God. The holy icon presents, depict, a new, reshaped, renewed, blessed, and sanctified creation, a holy man. That is, the icon presents itself as an open window to the eighth day.
Icon helps a man to spiritually mature, and it always spiritually exalts us and connects to its prototype. That is, it introduces us into the community with the living and triune Godhead. The visible image of Jesus Christ in the icons made with hands exalts us to his invisible deity. Therefore, the holy icons hold a great spiritual benefit to the church, through icons made with hands exalts to the immaterial God, as well as into the community of fellow man. One should know that the depicted figures of saints are present in the icons made with hands by divine grace and their actual presence allows the icon duel to enter into spiritual union with them and serve together with them in the mystery of salvation. The suffering, which are depicted at in icons made with hands, serve to us as a pedagogical exalting paragon of our own Christian feet and salvation. Holy icons elevate man's mind and heart to the living God with whom man enters into a personal relationship. Here the issue is not mere ethical advancement of Christian man, but rather something far greater and deeper. Imitation of a Christian man of the image presented on icon made with hands has substantial consequences for his salvations from death and deterioration. Image brings man into the community of the triune God. Icondulism and icon veneration aids man to be spiritually alert and to seek the gift from above. Fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council place the holy icons on par with the holy scripture the scripture and the holy icons coexist in the Orthodox Church on par with each other. They are inseparable from its liturgical life and both have the pedagogical and didactic as well as the spiritual and exalting function. However, the pedagogical and didactic significance of icons made with hands is not their greatest importance. Rather, at the first place, is the witnessing of the mystery of the true incarnation of God the Logos, the Word of God. The holy icon does not merely display of past events. It is an embodiment of the grace, a presence of a life rich in blessings of heaven and sanctification. The common goal of the scripture and icons made with hands is to summon man to salvation, and that man, having lit himself in the fire of love, acquire inside himself the image of the one in whose image he was created. Holy icons reveal to the man who looks at them the icon duel, the truth that from the beginning of its existence, from its birth, man has received the dignity of the image, likeness of God, but shall receive actual God's image only at the end according to his own efforts in imitating God. Through holy icons, Man gets the power of God to successfully run out the race of life. This is a great mystery. The scripture is not identified with the revelation because it in itself is not revelation. It is rather simply a record or a description of the revelation. By the same token, icon made with hands owes its existence to its prototype 
and it exalts or leads a Christian to it. Hypatius, Bishop of Ephesus, said that the icon is useful to the illiterate and that it exalts them from the material world into perception of the spiritual reality. Hypatius' error was in fact that he overemphasized the didactic character of the icon, believing that they were primarily intended for illiterate and less educated people, and ignored the most important facet of the icon, the liturgical and sanctifying. Hypatius' attitude was particularly accepted in the West, where in fact the didactic and artistic importance and respect of icons is exhausted while the theology of icon remains insufficiently acknowledged to this day. St. Nilus, a disciple of St. John Chrysostom, had proposed that the Christian churches be iconographed by figures and events from the Old and New Testament. Let the hand of the best painter fill the church on both sides with the images of the Old and New Testament so that the illiterate who cannot read the Bible would look at the painted scenes and remember the brave exploits of those who sincerely served God. In this way, they will be encouraged in pursuit of the glorious qualities with which God's servants were replacing earth for the heavens, preferring invisible to the visible. Since our nature is bipartite, created from the body and the soul, and our soul is not naked, but covered with a sort of curtain, we cannot get to spiritual things independent of our body, as we, therefore, hear the sensual word with our bodily ears and understand things of the spiritual. And watching over the body, we come to spiritually term view contemplation. Considering of all the human senses, sight has the highest acuity of perception of visible things. The ancient church had tried to focus all human senses, including sight and touch, on the knowledge and worship of God. The sanctifying power, possessed by icons made with hands, is a theme in direct connection with the role of sacred icons in the liturgical life of the Orthodox Church. Since salvation is truly achieved and liturgically experienced at the Church of Christ, holy icons are brought into direct connection with the liturgical mystery. According to Orthodox teaching, the existence of holy icons made with hands outside the mystery of liturgy is inconceivable, because the liturgy itself is, in its whole, a picture, an icon, of the order of salvation.
That is why, when entering Christian Orthodox churches, iconjuals approach the icon of Christ to kiss it, because it reminds them that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Icons of Christ teach the faithful that he is the door, and whoever enters through the door will be saved. John chapter 10 verse 9. Miraculousness of icons, in fact, points to the signs of blessings that have appeared through it. Whereas, the healing of the soul through an icon by contact with the spiritual world is above and more essential than the appearance of a miraculous aid. According to Orthodox Christian teaching, all the holy icons are miraculous because they possess a divine, immaterial grace. And that opinion is incorrect according to which only some holy icons are miraculous. In each holy icon made with hands, present is the blessed image of a saint, which fulfills the holy icon with grace that the saintly person possesses and carries inside. The grace of the Holy Spirit present in the icons made with hands makes them miraculous and sacred. And that was the reason for the opinion that there should be a separate act, prayers, with which icons are to be consecrated. Icons are already sacred because they are sanctified by the painted image of the saint, that is, God through the image of the saintly person. That certain holy icons are called miraculous and others are not, is closely related to the faith of the Christian man and with the mysteries of God's plan of redemption. Not because, allegedly, certain holy icons are not miraculous, According to the Orthodox teaching, holy icons are not soulless and dead matter, as was once the misguided opinion of the iconoclast. They are God-chosen means by which the living triune God enters into communion with man, revealing to him that life is a miracle, and that through holy icons, as reminders of the prototype above, we enter into a true, spiritual, and empirical journey.